Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versus Stars Podcast. How my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. This is a very special episode because Louise Simonson boards the Muller ship. Nora is one of the legendary writers behind the death of Superman. She's now the writer Jean Grey from Marvel Comics. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Miss Simonson. Thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. It's totally my honor. I'm a big fan of yours uh, for many years, and we'll discuss some of the Superman stuff that you you did. And thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. So I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for comics and who are your earliest influences? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I didn't read comics regularly until I was in my 20s. Um, I I read them on the spinner racks when I was a little kid. I had a very small allowance. I think it was a nickel. And then it, <laughs> it, got, it got bumped up to a dime. And you could get ice cream for a nickel or you could get a comic for a nickel. And I would go to the library and take out giant stacks of books for free and get ice cream. <laughs> I read I read books mostly. Um, my influences in, in books are, gosh, Robert Heinlein, um, Maybe the Narnia books, um, the the uh, um, Edward Eager books, Half Magic, and those books. Uh, you know, a lot of kids' books I read. You know, because I read those. Um, I read, oh gosh, I read adventure books. You know, little uh, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea and mm. that kind of thing, which were. I mean, this is a long time ago, way, way, way long ago, and um, you know, they didn't have quite the variety that they have now. I think. In our local library, but you know it was pretty good. A lot of Heinlein. So you said you went back, you found comic books basically when you were in your twenties. What finally made you decide in your twenties, I'm going to pick up comic books. I'm going to become a fan. Um, I think it was the art, the combination of art and and words. Mm. I um, I always liked art. I always liked pictures, and I always liked you know I've been reading words since I was a little kid, and it was a really it was an exciting combination have the two of them you know interposing I remember when I was uh, when I was young I was probably 11 um one of my girlfriend's brothers had a stack of comics hidden I guess under his bed and one of them was it was an EC comic it was one of the EC science fiction mm. comics and I read that comic and it blew my little kid mind it was like <laughs> oh wow this could even be true I don't know what it was about the, the comic that made it seem more like it could be real than reading a book mm. But um, yeah, I thought it was a, it was a Hollywood story. So and it was amazing. So when did you realize not not only were you going to be a fan of comic books, but you were going to be a successful comic book writer? What what what, what point did that click and go? This is where I belong. Well, it that I really loved being in comics mm. happened. Um, you know, I knew a lot of people because I lived in New York. You know, and I and I worked was working for a magazine publisher at the time, but I knew a lot of people in comics. And um, I I liked them all. I, they were really a fun group. And then uh, one of my friends told me that there was a job at Warren Publishing, which is a small black and white horror comic publisher that uh, I could uh, I, that paid better than my job. And so I applied for it, and I got it. And once I got there, I was I was just ready to stay in that world. I loved it. You know, I loved the people. I loved the the kind of work that they were doing. You know, I loved everything about it. Um, I didn't decide to write until, gosh, I I, I was um, invited to come over to Marvel and work there. And I worked as an editor for a few years. And then then was Jim Shooter was the editor in chief. And he thought that his editor should also freelance because we um, he thought it would give us better insights into the dealing with the freelancers mm. and I didn't really want to <clears throat> excuse me I didn't really want to take any work away from any freelancers I knew they were supporting their families by it right. so I thought well maybe if I invent something so I invented power pack so that's not taking work away from anybody yeah. and um I made that up and shooter liked it and then I was a writer <laughs> I mean, it was I, easy, I, right yeah I mean I mean obviously you became 
one of the legendary writers in the comic book industry. Um, you're, you, you wrote Superman Man of Steel, which during mm-hmm. the time of maybe the one of the major moments in the character's entire history, which is obviously the... Um, yeah. You actually you wrote it as well during while well, he got married as well. So marriage and the, yeah, I did both of those. The death of Superman, yeah, and the death of Superman. So, what what do you recollect about that time of your life when you were writing? Which, which is obviously the most iconic character in in the existence. I mean, it, when they talk about the most famous characters in the world, Superman, I think, has passed Mickey Mouse as being the most familiar in the entire world. So, what was that experience like for you? It's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know that I, I mean, I realized it on some level that, that I was dealing with a really iconic character. I mean, it was a character whose TV show I had loved mm. and in the comics I had read when I was a little kid, but um, and the, on the spinner racks, of course, because five cents. Um, and, uh, but I, it, I didn't, it should have intimidated me more than it did. I mean, it took me a while you know, maybe about four or five months to get used to working in our that that special DC, um, I guess milieu where we were we were treating each Superman book as a cha- chapter mm. in a monthly story, so that there were four at least there were four and then five Superman books. Um, we each we had this giant meeting where. We had the writers and the artists and the editors and the assistant editors and the pencilers, oh, inkers, uh, colorists even, um, at the meeting. And we all sat around this giant table and thought, thought discussed what we would do during the next year. Mm. And um, the Mike Carlin, of course, was the editor. And he, you know, it would have taken somebody of his caliber to actually pull something like this off. Um, we, he, we would write the sort of like the larger, like, the larger story arcs, I guess, on the uh, on the this, this, this whiteboard, and um, and you know then, then the subplots along, and then and then so everybody would get designated of, you know, the, whatever fell on your chunk of your your under your book is what you did. So you did the middle chapter of the story, or sometimes the beginning, or sometimes the end of the, cho- end of the story. So that was that took a little while for me to understand how it worked, but once I did, I just loved it. It was very much fun. Now, when you're writing as a team, because at the time there were, I believe, four Superman stories. There was Action Comics, Superman, Man of Steel, and Adventures of Superman. Mm-hmm. I remember those were the four. Now, well done. yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I have a lot of them on my wall. Oh, they're, I'm, I'm autographed, including yours. Um, I got it from Trificon, so they're all on my walls. So I can just look up and be like, those are the ones, right? And, and a lot of them are from Dooms, the Doomsday series. So, Very make sure cool. you get the, the autograph. Thank you so much. So, the the difficulty or the challenge I can um, I imagine exists is that. Not only do you have to write a good Superman story, but you have to write a Superman story that matches the tone and the voice of three other writers' versions as well. And not only that, but you have to be careful of where you end up in your story because you have to make sure they can make sense of theirs and connect. So how much how does that complicate things and make things more complex as a, as a writer? I don't think it actually complicated things or maybe even made them a little easier because... <clears throat> if you start off with a blank sheet of paper and no ideas, then it's kind of hard to you should really have to think but think of something. But a lot of our ideas had already been kind of thought out. At least we had a beginning point. Mm. We so we knew where a story was going to be end, end and we knew where it was going to begin. And you tried to you we all played fair with the other right other people. We didn't like try to steal the best mm. bits or um anything like that. We we kind of you know, you'd write your story and you'd, you'd try to do it with a beginning and a middle and an end of each story in each chapter mm. and to kind of make the, that your story about something, but yet conform to the overall diagram of what we were doing. Mm. Um, it, it was, I don't think it was that hard. It was actually kind of fun, you know, kind of slotting in. I mean, what the hard part maybe, particularly for the artists, poor artists, was trying to get their work done in a timely manner mm. because because we were in this kind of machine you had to pump i mean i i had a week to do my plot and then i we were working marvel style in these so we were working mm. you know plot to, to script um i would get the pencils i would have a week to do the to do the script and then off it would go to the next person and then you'd, you'd get the next story where you have to start the next one and you know just mm. pass it down and you couldn't if you fell behind, you were failing a lot of people instead mm. of just your 
own little team. You know, it was like the, the entire Superman group could, <laughs> could be disrupted. So yeah, you the, the difficult part was I think more in in making the deadlines and making mm. making the stories really good. I mean, too, because the, everybody was really pretty good at doing that stuff. So it was challenging in a way, you know, because, you know, I danced a pretty good writer and I was like, oh gosh, I better do something that's, you know, <laughs> he's as good as his or Roger, Roger Stern or, you so, know, other people. Yes. So when, when you're writing, as, as I said, you're, you're a member of this team of four writers, as, um, like I said, you had like Dan Jurgens, uh, Roger Stern, um, or, uh, Mr. Ordway, um, is there a one-upmanship involved or is it truly this um, symbiotic team of I'm not going to try to top what the other person's on. I just want to be sure we're continuing. Or was there a feeling of, I want to make sure that the, the best moments are my moments, you know, in, in my character. Well, you know, I think that we all wanted to do the best moments, but I think that for a lot of us, the best moments were different. Mm. Like I wanted I, my my best, most, my favorite moments were the character moments. Mm. And I think, you know, the other people might've liked, liked the big punch out moments or I don't know, just, you know, different kinds of things. And we all kind of got a chance to do the best moments and they weren't always the best moments that other people thought were best. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, 100%. Yeah, okay. Now, obviously, like I said, we're uh, the death of Superman. Um, there's been many stories about it. I had a, uh, the pleasure to talk to Mr. Carlin about it as well a little bit. What do you recollect about the moment, the days, weeks leading into the creation of that storyline, which obviously became one of the most legendary storylines in comic books? I mean, the Death of Superman storyline? Yep. Oh, gosh. I, you know, it's it was so long ago and it was so complex. I'm not sure I remember it as well as I should. Um, you know, when you're in the midst of it, you're it's just happening around you. Mm. Um I remember that we all were preparing to go into the, this, this giant Superman summit meeting and um, we all had ideas and uh, we went in and I think it was, I, I, as I'm remembering it, we had been discussing getting Superman married at that point. We'd been working up to it in the continuity and um, we, you know, worked out a continuity and all on our, on our, our big board. And uh I think Carlin brought Jeanette in and Jeanette said, oh, you can't do that. You can't have them married because they're, we have a TV show coming up in which they're not married and we can't, we can't con confuse our audience. It will confuse mm. our audience if, if he's, if he's married. So we said, oh gosh, we're doomed. There goes an entire, you know, several days worth of work. Yeah. So, you know, we sat around glumly for about five minutes and Jerry Ordway said, as he always does, did, let's kill him. <laughs> and, and we always said, yeah, ha, ha, ha. But this time we said, you know, Jerry, let's kill him. So we, we, we killed him. We decided we would do a death of Superman instead. So, and, I mean, like I said, that is such an amazing moment. And then the other thing um, for the challenge, one of the challenges that you had is that you had to write, you wrote the first um, issue of the, of the series, the Death of Superman series, and then you wrote the penultimate, uh, the one before the final issue of 75, you wrote the one right before it. So I think it's the first and maybe the sixth issue of that storyline. So in the first issue, you have to lay the groundwork for this mm -hmm. massive storyline. So how did you approach laying the groundwork for what Doomsday was going to be? Well, it's, as at that point, Doomsday was going to come out of nowhere and be a he and Superman were simply going to beat each other to death, which is pretty brutal. Mm. Um, and I think, is that the issue with the bird? Um, it's the one where they're fighting the the, the war worlders. And, and that, oh, he does squish the bird in that one. Yes, he does do that. Yes, he squished the bird. Yeah, that was, that just seemed to kind of, kind of, um, you know, envelop the character. It was, it was sort of, a, sort of like, like show just who that character was. It, it was funny. It, it reminded me, um, I assume you've seen the Terminator movie from was it 80, 45, where the, the, the car drives over the toy, the kid's toy, and you're just like, oh, he's the bad guy. He's running over oh, the there kid's you go, toy. There you go. <laughs> yep, so you knew who the bad guy was right away. And right. then the poor little bird went squish. <laughs> yeah, that was that was evil. That, that, that was a, you, you had some great moments in that. And like I said, one of the things that you had too is that in your first issue, um, Doomsday is sort of a a background a little bit of character he's he's right. setting the stage you're focusing more on the, i believe they were called the war worlders that you're kind of focusing more in so how are you using those characters to highlight more of superman to get the story rolling with doomsday 
oh lord i don't even remember this is, <laughs> this is really pathetic but i just don't um you probably know more about it than, i bet you remember more about it than i do i'm an ancient human <laughs> my, my, my memories have all erased um i mean we we always the war worlders were actually very cool and we always wanted superman to have foes who were um who would challenge him and i think the war worlders i mean in the end they weren't as much of a challenge as they would have liked to have been mm -hmm. but um you know i don't i don't even remember the details of that that's <laughs> pathetic <but> I <laughs> it, it's okay i i had the um I mean, I mean, I just reread the issues before the uh, the interviews. Oh, so, 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 yeah, so, so it's very fresh. I mean, I, I read I it when I, when I was younger. Because I, I will say, I remember very distinctly because Death of Superman came around the time when I got back into reading comic books. Um, as because around I was near the, a teenager at that point. I remember going to the comic book store with my father to buy these issues. My father was going to buy these for himself because he wanted you know the importance of the Death of Superman because he was a comic book reader when he was a kid. So you right. let me. So you let me read them before he did, or after he did it. He let me read them, so I'd be very careful with the pages. I didn't want to like bend anything. Oh, that's and nice. It, yeah, and so it's like it's it's it's, 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 it's so like in, part of my memory is just sitting there on my bed reading the comics that my father did to figure out what was going on with the new with Superman and going to the store with him to to make sure we got the issue before they sold out because that was before they had pull lists and stuff for whatever reason. That's so cool. Yeah, and like and I just remember um, the Doomsday. And I got a chance to read it again. And I really appreciated it. I think I actually appreciate it even more than the first time I was reading it because I was under seeing how you were laying the groundwork for the character beats. And and Lois as well, that you really were building up to uh, Lois Lane's and Superman's readership as well, a bit more in that s series because mm -hmm. uh, she was being held hostage and you kind of had the more of a sense of Superman's urgency. And I kind of figured, wondering if that was also something important is to build, to remind the readers why Superman and Lois are such important characters to each other. Yeah, um, you know, Superman is a powerful superhero. I mean, he's an alien mm -hmm. um, who was really very much the embodiment of, I don't know, Midwestern culture, I guess. Yeah. Um, but Lois is a human. I mean, she's a really smart, capable human, but she's just human. And she's kind of a a bridge between the, you know, the magical world of, that Superman exists in and the normal human world that everybody mm. else exists in. She's not a superhero herself, but she's pretty super. <laughs> and I think and another thing that was really cool is that when you wrote the, I think the sixth issue, at that point, they were doing something interesting with uh, Superman, where they're cutting the panels. So it was like two panels per page at that point. Oh, right. Right. And, and now... Go ahead. We were doing a countdown, you know, right. the splash, no, four panels, three panels, two panels in the splash issue. And and yeah, and the interesting thing is what you had to now tell a story with only two panels per page and was it 24 pages? How mm -hmm. was that restrictive having to keep to just a two, you know, that's short of a amount of pages and panels? Oh, it was challenging maybe, but not restrictive. I mean, we we managed it, obviously. I mean, and the story wasn't really complex at that point. Mm. So that and it wasn't it wasn't more complex than than we could handle with the amount of panels we were allotted. You know, we we work within the format that, you know, we the game we were playing. Right. <laughs> and once again, and also writing these the storyline, issue six, you have a you have quite a bit to do with Doomsday Superman. They're also gonna be battling out. It's gonna lead to the big issue 75 where Superman's gonna be killed. So on the one level, it has to be very impactful because it's leading into the end. But at the same time, you can't climax the story on issue six because issue seven has to be the biggest um right. issue. It's the last. So how much did you have to hold yourself back to make sure that you left enough on the table for, um, I think it was Mr. Jurgens who wrote issue 75. It was Dan, yeah. Um, I, you know, I didn't have to hold myself back because I knew that Dan was going to do the, the real death, but I wanted to build up to it and make it feel that it was, that the fight was important to the people of Metropolis. I think I, I really one of the things I enjoyed about the Superman books that, you know, Mike really em emphasized, and I totally agree with him, was that the metropolis itself was a character mm. and that the, the humans, the little people in uh, in metropolis were just as interesting as the big guy. So I think we enter we interfaced with those guys a lot. Now, the other interesting thing as well is that one kind of a challenge as well is that Doomsday, it's the, the, the Death of Superman series is basically a one long fight for almost six issues yes it what, is was, was it that? right what, 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 was it difficult to try to keep it interesting for that many issues because once again 
you have to make sure it's exciting, but at the same time, it's it's almost one long fight sequence for. I know. What is that? One hundred forty-four pages of story. I know. Isn't that ridiculous? But we did. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know. Were you interested? I I loved it, but I mean, Doomsday is a character yeah, that. Right, right. Because Doomsday became one of those characters where. I tend to buy the issues he shows up in after, like when he when he brought him back. I think it was um, Hunter Prey had Doomsday versus Superman. Right. He just recently showed up in I think it was Doomsday in Hell. And I bought that issue as well. He just became as um, as the story moves on such an intriguing concept uh, yeah. that he and and not only that I mean just even visually I mean he's such a a stunning looking character. Doesn't he look good? That was Dan Jurgens' design, and he really knocked it out of the park on that one. It's it, beautiful. It, it, it's it's wonderful, and like I said, and. I think it's just the idea of him as his force of nature that just kept coming at Superman. He's it, it just became such a cool, you know, what I'm saying because I mean even in the cartoons, um, I think he was in Justice League cartoon for a while. He shows up in. He's just <laughs> a fantastic character. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We did good on that one. It, 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 all of us contributed. I mean, it was really, it was really very much a, I think a, a real, a, a culmination of our our ability to create as a group. Mm. Now, reflecting back on on that storyline, um, as, as much as you can, um, why do you think it? Ha- I mean, other than the fact that Superman has died, which, let's face it, every character in, in comic books has died at some point. But yeah, most why, of them. right, most <laughs> of them. Um, uh, but why, yeah, or yeah, got their yeah, back yeah. broken like Nightfall? Why do you think <clears throat> that storyline has become iconic, and even I guess thirty years later, is still this well loved, well received storyline? Um, you know, I think that it was well done. I think that we all tried our best to do, make it the best story that we possibly could. And I think that that the work that we put into it really did pay off. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, the fact that also it, I mean, it was Superman. And it 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 really kind of showed we we did Superman in the world without Superman and what it was like and how everybody really wanted Superman back. Mm. And then, you know, brought Superman back. And that was, um, that was pretty cool too. So um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. You know, also it was, a, when this came out, it was a slow news day. What can I say? <laughs> there was nothing going on in the news and it made, I think it was NBC, nightly mm. news and Time Magazine for heaven's sakes. Um, and it, it just, it suddenly was announced it as, as news. And I think that that really helped, you know, in a way, make it seem like it was really something very important. I, and I would argue that it totally was. I mean, it, it's, I mean, that's, it was such a, a major thing, event in the world of comic books. And I remember, once again, when I was a kid, buying comic books with my father, the line leading like to the desk out the door was massive. I mean, oh. I mean, people were, there were more people in line than the stores had comic books for them. And I and and I remember sending those lines, hoping to God I didn't miss my issue, you know, so that, so we could get the storyline going. And I remember um, some people on the news, and they just stuck in my memory forever, where they were buying multiple copies of the Death of Superman, and they were saying, "These comic books are going to become so valuable. I'm going to put my kids through college on these comic books." Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and I I knew I'm sure that all of us knew that that wasn't going to happen because, you know, when you when a million comics, a billion comics get out there. You know, there's going to be so many of them that they don't, they aren't rare and they won't right. be valuable. And yet we couldn't, you know, I wanted to tell these people, no, no, it's a good story. <laughs> Read it, but you're not going to put your kids through college. But I couldn't do that. I, I actually felt kind of bad. I, mean, I wanted them to enjoy the story, but I wanted them to read it as a comic book and not as an investment that mm. you know they were going to be disappointed in. Luckily, it didn't take much of an investment to buy a comic book. Yeah. So I didn't feel, you may not, you know, I mean, I, I felt a little bad, but I, I guess it's kind of like playing the lottery. Yeah. You know, you plumped out a dollar and you got, you bought your dream and it's a pretty cheap dream. <laughs> it'll pay off. But no, it, you know, it's like the market is quixotic in its own way. Mm. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's crazy to pet, to play, you know, into a kind of a fad market that way. Anyhow. Tulips, tulips. It, there, there was a fad of buying tulips in Holland at one point. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, and they, you know, tulips like a, a tulip bulb would get, you know, would be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, which was just. In, and then, of course, people started being wanting to sell their tulip bulbs for thousands yeah. of dollars, and of course, 
they didn't, it was like a pyramid scheme. And he, I, and you always feel guilty about that kind of thing, but there's nothing that you can do. I mean, we, that was not our intention to mm. make everybody think they could put their kid. We just wanted to tell a good story. Now it kind of reminds me um, recently of the NFT boom, that uh, bubble that was there around for a long time where people were spending thousands of dollars. I think someone, I just read an article um, a couple of days ago that said, is the N- 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 NFT bubble officially dead? I'm thinking to myself, probably. So if you spend a thousand dollars on that NFT, it's worthless now. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I was kind of appalled at the NFT thing too, because it just didn't make sense. Right. But, you know, then I was told by some people that, you know, that I just didn't understand because I was too old and that the younger people wanted to carry things around that they didn't have to store on, you know, hang on their walls or store anywhere, which made a kind of sense, but you can get, do that for free. Right. <laughs> and you don't even, you don't even have to buy an NFT to, to, to have something in your phone that you can brag about to other people. So it just didn't make sense to me. And and like you said, there's nothing better than I think holding like a comic book or a book in your hand and reading <laughs> it. And like yeah. I said, one of my great pleasures is that I have my autograph wall uh, which is most almost into my entire house. My wife is awesome. Uh, autograph where I have all my awesome. autographs yes. in the top in a top loader, and it's other all on my wall. Uh, you know, uh, my Superman ones are all on my wall. Everything is on my wall, and it's cool. You can't autograph an NFT. Right. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> so after um, the death of Superman, you, uh-huh. like I said, we, you had your funeral for a friend, and then you had the reign of Superman, which each one of you had your own character. Right. That you got to push for a little while. I don't know how long that left. Was it like six months or so where those characters yeah, it was about, lasted? Probably about six months, I think. So which one did you develop for I your storyline? Steel. steel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I had come in with the, to the next meeting, the meeting that was going to discuss that, with the idea that we had been in such lockstep, walking and acting, you know, writing and, and drawing in lockstep for so long. I thought, it, I, I just want a little bit more freedom to... Mm develop a character all on my own. So I suggested that what if we came up with four Supermen? And I think, you know, it's possible that Carl Carl Kiesel came in with a a similar idea. And um, and so we started, you know, saying who we thought it could Superman could be. And I and we had thought that what about Steel? You know, man of steel, steel is not kind of obvious. And Mm -hmm. what do you steel steel driving man is John Henry Irons. And, you know, he's this, this big black guy with a hammer. So, of course, it was it just seemed like a natural to us. And mm. she's always been one of John Bogdanoff's favorite characters. And, so we did steal. And of all the of the characters that existed in the Superman storyline, uh, Reign of Superman, uh, Steel and Superboy seems to have the, have had the longest life. Yes. Because, it's... you know, he had that very popular um, series that came. I think he had a series that lasted over 100 issues. He yeah. had Infinity Incorporated. I think he was in for a while as well. He shows right. up in Justice League Unlimited uh, for several for for many episodes. He had a movie. Um, so, how does it feel to create a character that survived? And did you know the character was going to have that level, that length of life? Oh no, you never know. You always hope. You know, it's it's like you make up these little people, or big people in this case, and you try to do stories about them that will interconnect with interact with people interconnect with them that they'll you know they'll, they'll feel something for them mm. but you don't always know what's gonna hit hit and what's not um so you just do the best you can I've I've you know I created a few characters that I thought would be popular that you know just kind of went whoa and uh and yet you know steel really managed to survive I think yeah, I don't, I don't, he's, he looked good. That was a really, really nice steel costume that John Bogdanoff came up with. And I think, I think looking good does help. I will I, I agree that it, 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 he is a cool character um, that, you know, he grabs your attention with the big ass and the big, and that hammer is so awesome. The, yeah, yeah awesome. The, 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 big right. ass, the big ass hammer. But um, beyond that though, he's just a good character. And, he's a guy and a good character. And and I think what made him work so well, in my opinion, as, as the fan, not obviously the writer, is that I, f- I feel like his love of Superman and respect of Superman r- mirrored the fans' respect and love for Superman. Oh, what a lovely insight. I never thought of that before. That's <laughs> oh, really thank you. great. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Like that. So uh, I, I thought that was an intentional <laughs> that you, you were connecting the two. No, it, it just, you know, I tried to make a character. You always want to make a character that people want to spend time with. 
I mean, that's like the first thing. And I guess we did. I just never thought of him mirroring the fans' attitude towards Superman. I think mm. that's that's actually lovely. I'm glad we did that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> and another cool thing with Steel is that he was he's an early um, black superhero where in a time where there really wasn't many at all because he predates right. um, Milestone Universe as well, I believe. <laughs> yes, he does. As a okay. character. So okay. how important was that as well for you to create that character? You know, I didn't think of it that way. I I, 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 it, I had always thought, you know, I had, my daughter had some friends who were, you know, not just, you know, white, white guys, ordinary old middle-class white people. And, um, one of one of them, John, one of our friends named it was a young man named John, was it, it it asked me, I guess it was back when I was doing Power Pack about why there weren't any Latin mm. so enough Latin figures. There weren't enough people who were who were black. There were enough people weren't people who were like him. Yeah. And I thought he no, he was right. And we tried to then begin to include, you know, you get kind of locked into your own little a club or whatever mm. you know, the people that you see around you and that's what you, you make people look like but new york doesn't like that new york was had people of all kinds you know rich poor all ages um all colors all all races all religions and um we we i began to try to do that more and more in the comics in order to reflect what a city life is really like mm. and what human life is really like um so I, I think, you know, Steele certainly played into that. I, I valued that that ability to do that. Mm. But it's a responsibility, really, when you go in and you try to make up. I mean, I am, was a middle-aged, white, middle-class woman, right? right? What do I know about, you know, like, like Black culture? And, you know, so I felt I felt a responsibility to try to do it right. Mm. Um, and I think... I think I thought we had pretty much we got I got one kid came up to me and so we're doing a signing I think it was at Harvard of all places a bookstore right outside of Harvard and um he came up to me and he and he said oh wow he said I thought you were Lewis Jones I thought you were a <laughs> man and I thought you were what you're black and, it was like, and I said oh thank you thank you that is the nicest thing you could have said that was such a sweet thing to say so, and I said, I hope, she, I hope I did okay. And he said, yeah, yeah, just So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I did try to do it right. And John Bogdanov tried to do it right. And, you know, we hope, we hope that we succeeded. You know, where we failed, we, we didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> now, one question I did have about Steel is that um, I don't, um, when the issues come out, do you have a credit by credit on the character or? Probably. I don't know. I, I, I'm sure I, I must. <laughs> no, I, I was scared because I, I know this was a question as well, always about um, ownership in the within like DC and Marvel, whether or not the, the writers are getting proper oh, credit yeah, and I, stuff I, for I, the character. If, no, if they made if they, if they made the Steel movie, they gave me some extra money. Good, I, I, I want to make sure. That, 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 that's the... But we all actually get a little piece of anything from the, in the death of Superman. You know, when Doomsday appears, we all get a little tiny chunk of his appearance. So. You know, it's really a shared universe and it's a shared pot of gold. We hope it's a pot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I mean, I I, just, um, I want to thank you for how well you did with uh, Steel is awesome. Um, Super, the Superman was fantastic. All those um, issues that you did was fantastic. Uh, I know now you're working on a new series called Jean Grey. I am. So what um, interests you in the character and intrigued you to enough to want to create this? Is it ongoing or a miniseries? It's a miniseries. It's four issues. So, you know, so I... Oh, I ahead. was given four issues and she was dead. <laughs> well, it starts off with letting us know that she was going to die. Um, she says that I'm going to die. So was how was that your entryway into the storyline that you're going to kill her off in in the series? Well, no, I didn't. I didn't kill her off. She was she get, she's killed in. Um, there's a I don't even remember the name of the book now, but there's a big gala at the Hellfire Club in which the all the mutants are going to get together and choose a new team for the X-Men. And then there are some bad guys called Orcas who come in and, you know, take out mutants left, right, and center, including Jean. So she's, she's stabbed through the heart and she's dead. And that's where my story picks up. <laughs> that's a fascinating way. To, like, well, from that point, when, when you start off with a character being dead, then, or 
how do you then build a storyline around the dead character? Well, Jean has been known to be dead before. And there is, Marvel has something called the White Hot Room, which is kind of the nexus of the Phoenix and Jean's cosmic entity or whatever. Um, so Jean wakes up in the White Hot Room, essentially. And, or she doesn't wake up. She's kind of still groggy. She doesn't know where she is. Her her mind is kind of fragmented in past and future. She has a lot of memories, but she doesn't isn't necessarily know how to sequence them at first. Mm. And she 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 but she knows that she did something wrong. If only she had done the right thing. This there had to be a way. All she knows that all the X Men are dead. And it was her fault because she wasn't able to save them. And she, if she can only get it right, she can make a choice that will save them now. Mm. So then she she goes back through her past and tries to make different choices to see if she can get a better outcome. But mostly she doesn't. And there's a reason why she doesn't. So how, how hard was it to maneuver through the incredible complexity of the X-Men continuity, which oh. I, I must admit... I I mean I'm I'm a, I'm for the X Men goes I'm a casual X Men fan I'm more DC in uh, in my world I know I know I can tell yeah and I will ma- say that the X Men I mean any issue I've picked up of the X Men just because I do these interviews and sometimes I can pick up an issue is so complex and somebody convoluted that I find it hard to keep track of what's happening anymore I totally have a great deal of sympathy for that there are a lot of characters honestly I had. I usually don't go back and read books that I've done. Mm. Um, I mean, um, the, you know, the other people have taken over, even the ones I've, I've done myself. Obviously, I don't go back and read. But um, I don't go back, you know, just because you you read them and you think, well, that's not how Jean would act. You know, you that's the wrong, they've got the wrong voice there. What are they doing? So you don't want to think that. That's like stupid because they're not your toys anymore. Right. You play with them and you put them aside for somebody else to play with. Mm. So um, I... I don't know. I, I can't remember what the question was now. What am I babbling on about again? <laughs> the complexity <laughs> of the X-Men continuity. Oh, oh, oh the com- com- complexity. Oh, God. I So I, there was a good deal of X-Men continuity I had not read. It's been 40 years since I wrote that character initially. Yeah. That's a lot of continuity. I Luckily, I have a very good editor, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Brunstad. And um, she was able to get me some key issues that would work into the kind of story I wanted to tell, mm. including like I, I hadn't realized at that point that the X-Men had spent about, God, about six years. It's like forever going back and, you know, as when they were young kids or traveling back in time and, yeah. you know, visiting alternate universes and all that stuff. I had not realized that that had happened, but that mm. gave me a kind of a nice stepping stone for the first issue. And and she says um, in, in in the first because the first two issues are out right now. Yes. Um, she she talks about how she didn't choose not she chose not to wipe out the memories when old Hank told her to. Old Hank, uh, for those who, who don't know the name for Beast, uh, Beast in the future. Beast, yeah, he's the Beast. Yeah, told told her to wipe out the memories of the team of the original X Men team. Uh, going back, Iceman, Beast, uh, Angel, right. Jean yeah, Grey. Yeah, it was actually Black Cable too. Cable said he was they were supposed to do that. Young Cable, don't ask, just buy it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so how much is that because she also she goes where do things go wrong how much is that part of as well of things going wrong that she did not wipe the memories of well in my story it it was certainly a pivotal point that if she had not wiped the memories that would have changed all the continuity in fact all, the continuity would have been you know it would have spun the whole world off into an alternate timeline mm. um so that was a possibility and that seemed like a, a good place to, uh, that, you know, if I had been a kid and I had gone back in time and learned a lot of stuff and seen who the good guys were going to be and who the bad guys were going to be and learned to, to really control my powers in ways that, you know, I wasn't able to when I went into this six-year track, mm. um, I'm not sure I would want to just not remember. Mm. You know, I I think that took a lot of, faith or gumption or something to just make that decision. I probably would have done what Jean did. I would have said, screw it. I'm remembering. And then <laughs> it would have happened. <laughs> and I mean, interesting too is, um, you're going through the kind of scene, uh, um, 
kind of like the highlights of a timeline after that point of in, in history from early X-Men days to eventually in second issues, we see the point where the, I guess around the giant size X-Men days of uh, when Wolverine right. and Nightcrawler first appear. Um, yeah. And the Jean Grey that's there is a little more aggressive than the Jean I remember from back in the day. She's making mm-hmm. a lot of really rough decisions, some mind wipings going on. Um, she's very assertive in, in, in a way mm-hmm. that's kind of different for her. Um, to the point where her team abandons her, or basically tells her, you know, we don't be a part of this anymore. Right. So how dangerous is she now? Well, in that universe, she's pretty darn dangerous. Mm. But in the end, I should I tell people? They're, so, people will all, all, will all have read this, wouldn't they, by the time this comes out? Okay, um, she she shuts off for herself at least that universe um you know whether it's real or whether it's only real in the white hot room i'm not even sure i'm not sure where reality lies in the white hot room mm. i've got a a, a a quote something that the the phoenix says later on you know in 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 the room he says you know but but here all things are real mm. So this is a real universe that she's created, but maybe only for there. Is that why she seems to be willing to take greater risks than maybe she would have if she knew it was the regular continuity of the world? Well, yeah, I don't know. She actually has a feeling of exactly the regular continuity. I mean, she's kind of spaced out a little bit anyway, because she's Hmm. like dying. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think her only intent at that point is to try to figure out where what the where, where she went wrong and mm. to try to what she can do to fix it i mean that's her real her motivation and like i said it's it fun watching as well the development of her going through the timeline again you know once again we've seen the with the old x-men back in the day when they're younger the, the wolverine was really <laughs> seeing, cool yeah seeing just the different look of them isn't it and and i i, I can't imagine okay one of the coolest moments of um the series so far and one of the coolest moments of of the year in comics and i'm not just being um hyperbolic it really is is the phoenix wolverine which is such a bad <laughs> concept. Oh, yeah, wasn't that fun? How, how much fun was that to do that was really fun to do you know i it, i was really inspired by barry smith's um wolverine story where he did you know that he showed how wolverine was created essentially right right um so that i I, I'm pretty sure in that one, he had, you know, these spikes that came all out of his body. And I believe that that, also, that was what happened in Barry's story. So I kind of just played off of that. Only I threw the Phoenix into it and made it much, 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 much worse. So is this, is that, there. is that a character you think you're going to um, explore in the future? The Phoenix Wolverine? Don't know. You know, this is four issues and they're not my toys. They're, Marvel's toys and whoever Marvel assigns the, the you know so I can't say you know it, I don't I don't have that kind of control I'm a cog in the wheel you know <laughs> but like I said as a writer who has the legendary stars that you have do you not have sway to say I want this or that oh I wish you know, <laughs> no I don't I don't I don't have that kind of power at all I mean I can propose things but I I you know they they have the power of life and death as it were you know thumbs up and thumbs down as it were so <laughs> so yeah. so one of the great moments um in series as well is that jean gray states that allowing herself to be joined with the phoenix is not when things went wrong um is jean gray necessarily the best judge of knowing when things were right and when things were wrong that's a really good question well done thank you um you know she's she's the only judge there is at that point hmm. you know you you can't really you couldn't really say, you know, you can't, it's kind of like you, you go through your own life and you come up against a decision you have to make and you choose, you know, this road or that road or this road. And you don't know in advance whether it's going to be a good idea or a bad idea. Mm. I mean, some things that are, seem like great ideas, that the, there, there's that, that it seemed like a good idea at the time, you know, that, that, that famous last words phrase. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so I think that that's, part of it i don't think you can you know she's she's the only person who's who's able to make any kind of a judgment there there's nobody there but her Mm. and but there is the phoenix there also that's something the phoenix is lurking in the background throughout all of this so you know and and the phoenix will play a part so 
to go back to the idea of right and wrong, when she's determining when do things go right, when do things go wrong, is it when do things go right or wrong for her, or when do things go right or wrong for the world that exists um, in, in in our world, you know, that she's a part of? I think both of them. I mean, you know, the the first issue, the one that's that is is Jean Grey one, um, she, things she felt like things went wrong for her and for the X Men that she had gotten too powerful. She'd gotten things had really gotten out of hand. Mm. Um, and I think that at that, that point she sort of shut off that universe. I mean, she ends up like just, you know, poofing people out of existence, changing, changing people's minds, poof, killing people, poofing them out of existence. That's really a bit much. Yes. And that's, you know, and she's really basically an ethical character who, who just kind of, she set a, an option in motion mm. and she played it out to the end. And that was too much. And then she shuts it off. That's not right. Um, I do think that that partly she's a moral character. And when it offends her morality, when she realizes that she's gone really, really, really wrong, um, that's when she would, would was able to stop it. So thinking about the Phoenix, you said the Phoenix is lurking in the background. Um, you mentioned several times the Phoenix um, exists or at least um, doesn't. I mean, feeds not the right word, but connects very much to strong emotions. Right. So in the world of Phoenix, is drama not in the best interest of the Phoenix? Well, yeah, but the Phoenix has its own agenda and maybe it, it wants to heighten the drama. And maybe that isn't always a good idea for the person whose drama is being heightened. Because you can be a little aggravated and the Phoenix gets into you and you want to kill. Right. You know? <laughs> so really, it's it's it would take a certain element of a certain amount of control and understanding about what's happened to you, you know, from the outside, it's like probably like some kind of mental illness almost mm. where, you know, you would have a, a little control maybe, but it would be very, very helpful to know what was happening so that you could actually know when to exert control. Mm. And I think that, that the Phoenix is like that. The Phoenix I, heightens emotion, you know, for good or ill. And if Jean can only get it to, what Shooter used to have a, a saying, if only the power could be harnessed for good. Right. I love that. that you have, that's how the Phoenix is. If only the power can be harnessed for good. We'll see if Jean manages to do it. <laughs> now, the, another great thing about the Phoenix is that, once again, there's this supernatural element to it, or, or very much an alien th thought process to this thing. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's had plenty of interaction with human, human minds because it's merged with many characters. Right. So how human now is the thought process of the Phoenix? How much is, is it um, changed by the people it's interacted with? I think that it's been changed some. I think maybe you'll see a little bit of that in upcoming an issue or two from now. But I won't say any more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Jean Grey, um, kind of interestingly enough, is that a lot of the storyline of the first two issues um, is Jean Grey making these unilateral decisions for everybody and what she's going to do. Right, because uh, it's her life. Right. She can't decide for anybody else. She can only decide for herself. Well, yeah, and, and what I thought about that is that being in the white room and, and deciding what's wrong and everything else is her, she's also still potentially in a position to make decisions for everybody herself. So how right is it for her to make the decision knowing without the consent of all the ones she's going to be impacting if when she finally makes her decisions? Well, I think that was probably the, that was kind of the point of the first Jean Grey was that she was making a lot of decisions without consulting the team and they got really fed up with it. So in the second one, she tries to back off and not make decisions. She lets Wolverine decide, but that didn't really work out too well either. <laughs> is a character with heightened emotions and, you know, and then poor old Scott. Yeah. <laughs> who tried his best to control it, but you know, he knew he was doomed. <laughs> and it, it, it's such a these I'm first two issues are, are fantastic you, you did a great job with, with these two issues with uh, the storyline um, what are some of the things that readers can look forward to in the future of the Jean Grey miniseries well I can't tell you because because <laughs> then you'd know and you wouldn't have to read them um, <laughs> you know I, I think that maybe we find out a bit more about the Phoenix I, I would I, I actually would love to there are, there's another moment of decision where, you know, I, I read it, when I read it, 
when I read the Hellfire Club, I wondered something. When the Hellfire Gala story where Jean dies, I wondered something. And then I was able to kind of ask that question and answer it in the fourth issue. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so <laughs> you said the fourth issue miniseries, and this wraps up. What's next for you? I don't know. I we're we're we're, we're just buying another house. We're cha- moving houses. So I'm kind of thinking that right now, I I think that I am going to be completely inundated with house moving. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to do any comic work for maybe the next three or four months. Um, I am working on something with um Chandra Sema eventually that will get eventually done but it's it's going slowly now so we'll you know we'll see what happens with that well i hope hope you come back on to talk about it you've been an absolute pleasure and as great of a person to talk to as i was hoping so thank you so much oh, thank you it was so much fun talking to you too you asked really good questions okay you too okay.